You're listening to the Corbett Report. Basically, there are four elements that I have to receive information regarding. Not out of the the worst U.S. terrorist attack in history, the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrow building in downtown Oklahoma City. The explosion shook central Oklahoma, killed nearly 170 people and injured more than 400 others. Someone had detonated a rider truck filled with explosives outside the building. The only suspect actually charged in the bombing so far is Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. The Oklahoma City bomber. The face of American terrorism. The face of evil. On the morning of April 19, 1995, the Alfred P. Murrah building was torn apart by explosions, killing 168. Office workers, passers-by, children in the building's daycare center. Horrified, a nation in grief turned to the authorities for answers. Now, 20 years after that tragic day, we all know the story the public was told. Less than a week away now from the 20th anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. It's still the largest act of domestic terrorism our country has ever seen. At approximately 8.40 in the morning on April 19, 1995, a slow-moving rider truck was seen near the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. A rider truck loaded with a diesel fuel and fertilizer bomb blew up next to the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, cutting it in half. 168 people, including 19 children in its daycare center, died. There you can see as the building was just simply cut away by this huge explosion. Collapsed into a shifting house of cards. Pulling at the rubble, they sometimes wonder whether they're tugging the piece that holds it all up. The nationwide search for suspects in the Oklahoma City bombing. The government has claimed McVeigh was alone. Terry Nichols was later also arrested and convicted as an accomplice. The plot was said to be an attempt to avenge the deaths of about 80 people in the government siege at the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, exactly two years earlier. And that story quickly centered on one man. Timothy James McVeigh was born April 23, 1968, in Pendleton, New York. Tim, in his neighborhood, got to be pretty well known for being kind of an attention getter, an out, out, outgoing type kid. For Timothy McVeigh, guns would become a lifelong passion. McVeigh's decision to join the Army in 1988 comes after high school and a series of dead end jobs. With his love of guns, this is a natural fit for him. He and his unit, parts of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, were sent to the Gulf and were in place, ready for war, by January 1991. When the war ended, his unit was part of the security force assigned to guard General Norman Schwarzkopf in Saudi Arabia. McVeigh says several key events caused him to, in his words, snap. Beginning in 1992, when federal agents killed the wife and young child of white supremacist Randy Weaver, during a standoff at Ruby Ridge, Idaho. A call for an imminent war with the government spreads to cell groups across the far right. Timothy McVeigh also becomes convinced by this time. Shortly thereafter, he writes Michael and Laurie Fortier, telling them that he wanted to take action against the government. He then enlists the help of his old army buddy, Terry Nichols. The Regency Tower security cameras photograph McVeigh's rider truck passing by on his way to the Murrah building. One of the individuals believed to be responsible for Wednesday's terrible attack on the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City has been arrested. A highway patrol officer pulled over Timothy McVeigh less than two hours after the bombing for a missing license plate. In 1997, McVeigh was found guilty on 11 federal counts of murder and conspiracy. He was sentenced to death and executed in 2001. Timothy McVeigh. We've been told so much about him. What he did. Why he did it. What it meant for America. But how much of it is true? For 20 years, a handful of tireless researchers have been working to expose the lies surrounding the legend of Timothy McVeigh, the lone wolf terrorist mastermind. And what they have uncovered has been remarkable. These researchers are not isolated cranks, but U.S. Air Force weapons experts, 
Oklahoma state representatives, FBI whistleblowers, government informants, attorneys, eyewitnesses, veteran journalists, and many others whose direct experience contradicts the narrative of the OKC bombing that we have been told. But perhaps the most compelling contradiction of the official story comes from McVeigh himself. According to the official account, McVeigh had set his sights early on in his military career on joining the Special Forces, and it was the frustration of not achieving that goal that caused him to quit the forces suddenly and unexpectedly in 1991. During his stay at Fort Riley, Kansas, McVeigh had been selected to try out for the Special Forces, the exclusive Green Berets, his dream assignment in the military. And had trained extensively for it, doing hundreds of push-ups and hundreds of sit-ups every day, carrying 100 pounds of gear 13, 15 miles a day to get himself in the physical condition for the course. The Gulf War changed that for him. Sergeant Timothy McVeigh was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor and the Combat Infantry Badge for his part in the fighting. When the war ended, his unit was part of the security force assigned to guard General Norman Schwarzkopf in Saudi Arabia. Suddenly, he was told to return to the United States. His long-desired wish to try out for the Special Forces, his revered Green Berets, had finally become a reality. He was getting everything ready. He was happy. He was excited. He was moving, you know, because he was going to the Special Forces. One week later, Sergeant Timothy McVeigh was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, undergoing the strenuous Special Forces tryout. But he was not the soldier he had been before the war in the Gulf. After living in the desert for four months, he was physically drained, uh, particularly the desert conditions. His equipment was wore out. One of the tests was for him to carry a 45-pound sack with him on a long journey. He was wearing new boots. His ankles were aching. His body and mind were physically out of shape. His feet were blistered. His ankle was sprained. At that point, McVeigh knew he could not pass the physically grueling Special Forces tests. It was the most devastating thing that had ever happened to him. And he sent a written notice to the camp supervisor, a voluntary statement of withdrawal. It reads, I am not physically ready. It was his first failure in the military, and his buddies saw a, really a, an altered McVeigh when he returned from that experience. Uh, he was somebody who had succeeded in everything in the military before. Now he had failed, uh, and he seemed somewhat embittered and soured. But in a letter to his sister in October 1993, published in the New York Times in 1998, McVeigh tells a very different story. Why would Tim, characteristically non-drinker, super successful in the army, private to sergeant in two years, top gun, bronze star, accepted into special forces, all of a sudden come home, party hard, and, just like that, announce he was not only disillusioned by the special forces, but was in fact leaving the service? He goes on to answer, now here's what led to my current life. It all revolves around my arrival at Fort Bragg for Special Forces. We all took intelligence, psychological, adeptness, and a whole battery of other tests, out of a group of 400. One day in formation, 10 social security numbers were called out, no names, and told to leave formation. Mine was one. The 10 of us were told that out of the select group of 400, we had scored highest on certain tests. We had been selected because of our intelligence, physical makeup, and physical abilities. We were to feel special, part of a hand-picked group. We were all asked to volunteer, talk about peer pressure, to do some work for the government on the domestic as well as international front. What I learned next, both from the briefings and from the questions and private talks, included 1. We would be helping the CIA fly drugs into the U.S. to fund many covert operations, and 2. Military consultants were to work hand-in-hand -hand with civilian police agencies to quiet anyone who was deemed a security risk. We would be government-paid assassins. How did the New York Times address these startling claims in a feature-length article on the letter? A single, parenthetical remark. The government has always denied such activities. This is a remarkable claim, to be sure. But the question should not be whether or not this version of events has always been denied in an unattributed way by an unidentified representative of an unidentified government agency, but whether or not there are facts to back up the claim. 
So what evidence can we find in the public record that would shed light on the question of whether or not McVeigh was, in fact, still in the military at the time he wrote the letter? And, if such information exists, how does it change the story of the Oklahoma City bombing? Firstly, it makes sense to ask whether or not such a claim is even possible. Does the military engage such task forces of undercover operatives to carry out off-the-record missions? The answer to that question is yes. That answer comes from a number of sources, including Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. As a colonel in the U.S. Air Force and Chief of Special Operations for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Prouty worked from 1955 to 1964 as the liaison procuring military supplies, equipment, and logistics support for CIA Special Operations worldwide. In his 1973 tell-all, The Secret Team, Prouty discussed the inner workings of America's intelligence community, noting, Sheepdipped is an intricate army-devised process by which a man who is in the service as a full-career soldier or officer agrees to go through all the legal and official motions of resigning from the service. Then, rather than actually being released, his records are pulled from the army personnel files and transferred to a special army intelligence file. Substitute, but nonetheless real appearing records, are then processed, and the man leaves the service. He is encouraged to write to friends and give a cover reason why he got out. He goes to his bank and charge card services and changes his status to civilian, and does the hundreds of other official and personal things that any man would do if he really had gotten out of the service. Meanwhile, his real army records are kept in secrecy, but not forgotten. This tactic was used, for example, in Project Heavy Green during the U.S. military participation in Vietnam in the 1960s. Restricted from deploying troops in Laos by the 1962 Geneva Accords, 48 Air Force personnel were instead sheep-dipped and deployed in Laos as civilian employees of Lockheed to service a bombing radar installation there. But was McVeigh sheep-dipped? By its very definition, this process is designed to be hidden from public view. Under such an operation... McVeigh's resignation, paperwork, even his personal life, would all look exactly as it should if he had genuinely been discharged from the military. Even more frustratingly, the sources of information that could potentially prove that McVeigh was in fact sheep-dipped are being deliberately kept from the public. Take the testimony of Terry Nichols. He is serving an unprecedented 161 consecutive life sentences for his part in the bombing at ADX Florence a supermax prison in Colorado where he shares a cell block with Ramzi Youssef and Ted Kaczynski. In 2007, he provided a sworn deposition to attorney Jesse Trendu, where he stated, In December of 1992, Timothy McVeigh told me that while he was serving in the U.S. Army, he had been recruited to carry out undercover missions. McVeigh again told the same story to one of his fellow inmates on death row, David Paul Hammer. Uh, McVeigh told me and uh, another inmate here that uh, he was actually an agent working for a guy he called the Major, and he met this allegedly met this man when he reported to uh, for special trainings duty, and uh, he was told to wash out his special training and uh, asked to accept uh, uh, what was called black ops operations, and he would be working as as an independent person, as a part of, and that he would recruit people to be in his unit. According to McVeigh, uh, this association went on for uh, several years, from the end of 1993, excuse me, 1992, uh, and throughout the, the day of the bombing of the Merle Building on April 19, 1995. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the federal government has made it as difficult as possible for the general public to access this information or find out more about these claims. After granting the interview discussing McVeigh's military connections, Hammer was placed on lockdown and even prevented from contacting his attorneys. After receiving Nichols' sworn declaration that McVeigh was an undercover army operative, attorney Jesse Trenadu was prevented from gaining access to depose Nichols by a federal judge. The judge in McVeigh's own case also placed sensitive documents obtained by the defense during discovery under seal, documents that the producer of Oklahoma City bombing documentary A Noble Lie claims prove these connections. So perhaps we can start with just laying out the parts of the record that we can all agree on about Timothy McVeigh and his background. Well, uh, he actually served in the U.S. Army. 
He was on the security detail for General Schwarzkopf, the, at the time the uh, uh, LA, uh, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the first Persian Gulf War back in 1990. And uh, he was a, uh, a sharpshooter and uh, a sniper. And he was uh, co commended actually when he was in custody in the Denver County or the Denver uh, Federal Courthouse awaiting trial. The Army uh, had to award him uh, two medals of commendation for his stellar service. As far as the Special Forces, um, where it's still murky, we weren't able to find any uh, documentation to support the fact that he, he did uh, work Special Forces. But we do know that he was um, a, an employed, uh, employee by the, the CIA. He was a drug smuggler and a professional assassin. And this was in the two and a half years leading up to uh, the, uh, the devastation of April 19, 1995. We also know that he was on a joint task force with the ATF and the FBI trying to recruit people to help him blow up federal buildings in seven different cities around the United States. What you have just said will be stunning to those who have only heard the mainstream narrative of McVeigh. Um, so let's talk about the, the pieces of evidence that document what you're talking about. We were able to uh, go through the defense uh, counsel records. Stephen Jones was uh, very generous in giving us access to those records. They're stored at a particular institution on the campus of UT Austin. And through the hard work of uh, Wendy Painting, one of our key researchers, uh, oddly enough, she was uh, born and raised uh, less than an hour from where McVeigh was uh, raised in, in upstate New York. But she had uh, paid uh, several visits to Austin and was able to access these records. The curator of the institution was very uh, kind to us as a film crew. And um, I had the honor of actually joining her about the two and a half, three months she was down there off and on over the course of nine months. I joined her for three days and uh, saw what she was going through and the, the records. I mean, this is what the defense counsel through uh, discovery process was able to put together. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the trial only lasted three and a half weeks. So they weren't able to present a lot of this evidence. And it was by uh, the, the efforts of Judge Mace, who was the presiding judge, he put a lot of these records under seal, was never allowed to present to the defense uh, or to the, the jury or the prosecution. The prosecution wasn't even aware of the records. So it was a very stunted and very uh, unfortunate uh, set of events on that, that short trial. So what does this evidence amount to? Are these claims true? Until McVeigh's full defense records are unsealed, where witnesses like Nichols and Hammer are deposed and their testimony investigated by a grand jury, researchers will have to rely on evidence in the public record to corroborate these claims and arrive at a better understanding of the bombing and McVeigh's role in it. We do know that in August of 1993, director Bill Bean recorded some footage of Camp Grafton, a National Guard training center that provided explosives and demolitions training, while scouting locations for a film shoot. While filming at Camp Grafton, one and a half years after McVeigh's supposed discharge from the army, Bean had an encounter with a man he now firmly believes to have been McVeigh. So what's your job? What was that? What's your job? I'm a parts clerk. I just... Oh, you're just parking this one, huh? Yeah, basically. Hi, my name is Bill Bean. I work in the film industry. On August 3rd, 1993, I was at Camp Grafton, North Dakota. Camp Grafton is a military training academy for the United States Army, the Army Reserve, and the National Guard. The reason I was there was to scout locations for a film project I was working on. I was given a tour of the base, it's designated by Colonel Dahl. We were by the uh, motor pool, and there were a large group of tanks that were parked there. I saw two soldiers parking a, an armored vehicle. I asked the billeting director if I could go over and interview the soldiers. So I walked over to the armored vehicle. It had a porthole in the back. I entered inside. The soldier who had been driving the vehicle was closing a hatch in the front. When he turned around, he looked at me and he froze. I had my video camera running and I said to him, what's your job? And he looked at me and he said, what? I said, what's your job? He says, I'm nobody, I'm just a parts clerk. On August 3rd, 1993, is when I videotaped and interviewed Timothy McVeigh a year and a half after he was supposedly out of the military completely.
So what's your job? What's that? What's your job? I'm a parts clerk. I just. Oh, you're just parking this one, huh? Yeah, basically. Was McVeigh involved in explosives training at Camp Grafton after his supposed discharge? Camp Grafton denies that McVeigh was ever present on base, but beyond the physical resemblance to McVeigh, Professor Michael Blomgren of the University of Utah conducted a voice analysis of the tape and found an 86% match between the person speaking on the tape and audio of McVeigh's interview on 60 Minutes. I ended up going to uh, Professor Blomgren at the University of Utah who's in the speech pathology department. He did a voice forensics test. He did uh, various uh, computer and scientific tests on it and uh, did human voice analysis tests also. His final report to me was that he would testify in a court of law that this is Timothy McVeigh. Uh, He had compared it to a 60 Minutes interview and found uh, a near perfect, near exact match. This footage is possible corroboration of McVeigh's story, but it is only that. Possible corroboration. What else can we find on the public record that helps to back up this fantastic tale of McVeigh as a sheep-dipped Special Forces operative? Let's start by examining Nichols' declaration. In it, Nichols, fearing for the safety of his family, notes, I cannot possibly discuss in this declaration all the information I have concerning the Oklahoma City bombing and others involved, but crucial parts of this terrorist act remain hidden from the American people, especially the identities of the Others Unknown, who collaborated with McVeigh in the bombing. Nichols goes on to reveal the name of one of these collaborators. After noting McVeigh seemed upset and angry in learning about a change in targets for the bombing, Nichols writes that, in what I believe was an accidental slip of the tongue, McVeigh revealed the identity of a high-ranking FBI official who was apparently directing McVeigh in the bomb plot. The name McVeigh let slip was Larry Potts, lead FBI agent at Ruby Ridge. According to Nichols, McVeigh was furious with Potts for changing the script on the bombing and, presumably, targeting the Murrah building. So, who is Larry Potts? Larry Potts was described as the Bureau's fastest rising star in the early 1990s, and as such was in the center of the Bureau's two most controversial incidents of that time, the Ruby Ridge shootout in which Vicki Weaver and her 14-year-old son were killed by federal agents, and the Waco standoff that ended with federal agents burning down the Branch Davidian compound, killing 76 men, women, and children. In May of 1995, directly after the Oklahoma City bombing, he was promoted to Deputy Director of the FBI, where he was Chief Operating Officer in charge of hundreds of criminal investigations. He was also the lead investigator on the bombing of the Murrah Building. So do we have any evidence that the FBI participated in a cover-up of the OKC investigation? The answer is such a resounding yes that even high-ranking FBI officials have alleged just such a cover-up. We know there were 24 people that were interviewed by the FBI that said they saw Mr. McVeigh on April 19th with someone else, and they had no reason to, to make it up. They didn't have a dog in that fight. They didn't have any reason to just to make something up. They, they told the agents exactly what they saw, and the agents wrote it down. If only one person had seen it, or two or three, but 24, 24 people say, yes, I saw him with somebody else. That's pretty powerful. That Danny Colson, the man in charge of the FBI's collection of evidence from the Oklahoma City bombing, is himself alleging a cover-up, is significant. As Colson points out, in the immediate wake of the bombing, the largest manhunt in the history of the Bureau was launched to find the two men who were reported as having rented and driven the Ryder truck to its destination. John Doe No. 1 was soon identified as McVeigh, but John Doe No. 2, his accomplice, remained at large. Who is John Doe No. 2, and where is he? Employees at the truck rental business in Kansas also helped with a sketch of a man who they say was with McVeigh, a square-jawed suspect with a tattoo on his left arm. Authorities made a second, then a third sketch of John Doe II with a ball cap, based on a description from an Oklahoma City man who says he gave McVeigh and John Doe II directions to Northwest 5th and Harvey, the Mara building, 30 minutes before the bombing. So he pulls up and, what, gets out of the truck? No, he pulls up and I go up to the truck. I went to see what he needed. Um, he said he was kind of lost a little bit. He said he was looking for uh, Fifth and Harvey, was the words he gave me. He, didn't, he did not distinct a building, the Murray building or nothing like that. He just asked me where a direction of Fifth and Harvey was. 
I kind of tried to explain it to him through verbally, and it, uh, he could seem a little confused by the way I was explaining it to him. So at that time, he got out of the truck, and I kind of walked him about three or four feet from where we were standing and pointed it out to him, the direction where it was. Now, all these accounts share a common and unsettling similarity. The witnesses say they saw several accomplices, including the infamous John Doe number 2. ATF officials tell us the elusive John Doe is still part of this case, but will not comment any further. However, they did tell us that there's a lot about this case we don't know yet. Information you can't find in the indictments against Timothy McVeigh, Terry Nichols, and Michael Fortier. The first man is of medium build with a light brown crew cut, and he is right-handed. McVeigh is identified as the mystery man John Doe 1 and arrested. The second man is also medium build. He's further described as 5 feet 9 inches to 5 feet 10 inches tall with brown hair and a tattoo visible on his left arm. What happens next is a conspiracist's dream. John Doe number two remains at large. He should be considered armed and extremely dangerous. But two months later, the FBI calls off the search. The official line is, John Doe 2 doesn't exist. Why was the manhunt called off? Why were 24 separate eyewitnesses along the rider truck's route that morning dismissed as having imagined his existence? Is it because even more damning evidence of John Doe number 2's existence, and more importantly his identity, was about to emerge? It was just hours after the bombing when the news channel first told you about the possibility that surveillance cameras may have captured the explosion and the killers on tape. Our sources and sources for the LA Times describe what's actually on those tapes. The information shows some huge surprises, the biggest that it may have been John Doe number two, not Timothy McVeigh who detonated the bomb. Brad Edwards has the latest on the investigation in this exclusive News Channel report. Our new information comes directly from a source that has seen parts of those surveillance tapes. It also comes from reports now in the Los Angeles Times, but perhaps the biggest surprise is contained in the News Channel's own information. Timothy McVeigh was not the last person to leave the rider truck. In fact, another man sat inside the cab of the truck after McVeigh got out. We believe that man is John Doe number two, a man who, for all we know, is still on the loose, leaving open a vital question. Was it John Doe number two who actually set off the bomb, not Timothy McVeigh, as we've all been led to believe? News Channel 4 has for weeks been demanding copies of the surveillance tapes from the FBI. The federal government so far is dragging its feet. But many people in the investigation have seen the tapes, and now so has a source willing to describe to the News Channel what the tapes show. The LA Times report shows there was a surveillance camera near the corner of 5th and Harvey, and another near the corner of 5th and Robinson. Federal investigators recreated the time sequence leading up to the bombing by matching the video and still photos from the surveillance cameras. Since we can't show you the tape ourselves, we're reenacting what our source says he saw on those tapes. As witnesses told the news channel before, the tapes show the rider truck parked in front of the Murrah building where we now know the blast went off. As witnesses also told us, the tapes show two men sitting inside the rider truck. A man strongly resembling Timothy McVeigh gets out of the driver's side, steps down. He then appears to have dropped something on the step up into the truck. He bends down and appears to pick something up off the step. Then he turns and walks directly across 5th Street toward the Journal Record building. All this time, John Doe number 2 is still inside the rider truck's cab sitting on the passenger side. Time passes. The surveillance tape is time-lapse photography. Without knowing exactly the time interval between shots, our source can't be sure how long John Doe number two sat in that cab. What was he doing all that time? Then the tape shows John Doe number two getting out of the passenger side of the rider truck. Again, the tape shows that a bombing witness accurately described what happened next to News Channel 4. I was standing in the building, and uh, I was looked out window and I seen uh, a door of truck and I seen the man get out of the last truck. The tape shows John Doe number two getting out, shutting the passenger side door. He steps toward the front of the truck and is momentarily out of the frame of the surveillance camera. But shortly he appears back in frame 
walking toward the rear of the truck, still on the sidewalk in front of the Murrah building. Again, he turns east toward the front of the truck, looking toward the street. John Doe number two then walks diagonally across 5th Street toward the east, as if heading toward the YMCA or the intersection of 5th and Robinson. He again leaves the frame of the camera. Another camera shooting from another angle clearly shows the actual explosion that destroyed the federal building and killed 169 people. In any normal trial, the footage of the defendant at the scene of the crime with the alleged murder weapon would be the centerpiece of the prosecution. But this was no ordinary trial. Not only did the FBI never produce the surveillance footage in court, they never released it at all. Despite multiple sworn affidavits showing that the tapes exist, that they show John Doe number 2, and that the cameras were removed from the scene by the FBI on the day of the bombing, they have still never been shown to the public. After a years-long court case that continues to this very day, the FBI claim that they have searched their records for the tape, but they just can't find it. So why is the FBI so concerned about keeping this footage from the public? It shows two things which could completely change our understanding of what happened on April 19, 1995. The first is the possibility that the Ryder truck bomb was not the only bomb at the Murrah building that day. The first bomb that was in the federal building did go off. It did the damage that you see right there. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. That they have found a second explosive device of some kind inside this building. Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found. One device was, uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device. That in fact two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. A second bomb was found on the east side of that building. A bomb squad is on the scene. The medical teams downtown are unable to get into the wreckage to retrieve more of the injured because of the presence of other uh, bombs in the area. Well, I just took a look down the street uh, at the Mara building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. As retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Ben Pardon noted in an exhaustive report in the wake of the bombing, the evidence is conclusive that the Ryder truck bomb could not have accounted for the damage done to the Murrah building. I went to a two-year graduate program, eight quarters of armament engineering graduates, the first course that was ever set up. And after that, I worked at the Ballistic Research Laboratories at Aberdeen, which was two years of hands-on work designing, developing continuous rod warhead for the Blue Martin missile and other weapon systems. Well, the uh, truck bomb even though it was fairly massive, it was somewhat removed from some of the structures that were damaged. It, it clearly had some what you call Boussant's damage, where the blast pressure was way above what you would expect to get from the truck at that distance. Boussant's damage is that caused by an explosive whose blast wave is powerful enough to shatter and destroy the material affected. The problem with the failed columns at the Murrah building is at that distance, the air blast from an anvil bomb would have been 10 times less powerful than what was needed to dissolve the concrete and cut the rebar. Those columns, had they failed due to air blast, should have broken with sharp chunks of concrete connected by rebar, not sheared off at critical points. Brissant's damage indicates contact explosives placed directly on the beams. Even more perplexing is the total collapse of column B3, which caused the floors on the east side to pancake onto one another. The building was gutted to within feet of the other side. Column B4, closer to the truck bomb, is completely intact. Yet we are supposed to believe that a blast wave traveled through B4, leaving the sheetrock almost untouched, and completely destroyed the column farther away. And most of the front columns were destroyed when the supporting header beam failed. But the cause of failure, supposedly being air blast, should have thrown it into the building. Instead, it fell straight down and rolled towards the crater. General Parton's report was conclusive. The Murrow Federal Building was not destroyed by one sole truck bomb. The major factor in its destruction appears to have been detonation of explosives carefully placed at four critical junctures on supporting columns within the building. Many independent experts concurred with the Parton report. Sam Cohen, inventor of the neutron bomb, issued this statement. 
I believe that the demolition charges in the building that were placed inside at certain key concrete columns did the primary damage to the Murrah Federal Building. It would have been absolutely impossible and against the laws of nature for a truck full of fertilizer and oil, no matter how much was used, to bring the building down. The FBI put all their weight behind the lone bomber theory and tailored the evidence to fit that scenario. Dr. Frederick Whitehurst, a supervisor at the FBI crime lab, turned whistleblower over the Bureau's handling of the evidence in the Oklahoma City bombing. Release a report today condemning the FBI crime lab for mishandling evidence and for slanting its analysis. The report is expected to specifically criticize the lab's handling of the Oklahoma City and World Trade Center bombing cases. It was the allegations of FBI whistleblower Frederick Whitehurst that sparked that investigation. Forced to resign, Dr. Whitehurst testified in Terry Nichols' trial that a fellow FBI chemist had changed his findings and lied under oath after meeting with federal prosecutors. The Office of the Inspector General, or OIG, investigated Whitehurst's charges and issued a report which concluded that the FBI crime lab had improperly identified the characteristics of ANFO, the weight of the bomb, the detonation system, and even what kind of explosive was used. But perhaps even more importantly, the missing surveillance tapes from the Murrah building threatened to reveal the identity of John Doe No. 2. And as it turns out, there is every reason to believe that the missing accomplice in the case is, exactly as McVeigh himself alleged, a government informant, agent, or operative. Documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act over the past decade have exposed a long-classified FBI operation from the early 1990s. This operation, dubbed PATCON for Patriot Conspiracy, involved FBI infiltration of the militia movement, including the very circles that McVeigh himself, model soldier and special forces recruit, was now moving in. Attorney Jesse Trenadu has been one of the most outspoken voices about the PATCON operation and how it relates to the events in Oklahoma City. As I pursued this uh -huh. over the last 16 years and, and lots of lawsuits and fights with the FBI, I stumbled across an operation that the FBI called PATCON, P-A-T-C-O-N. PATCON was an acronym for Patriot Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And the FBI began to distance itself from PATCON when I was probing. And they said it was just a simple operation where they were going to infiltrate some militia folks in Alabama who had stolen some night vision goggles from a military base and were selling them. But it was clear to me that PATCON was bigger than that, much, much bigger. And there were PATCON operations going on all over the country. And they, were, they referred to them as PATCON Group 1, PATCON Group 2, PATCON Group 3. Uh, PATCON, I, meaning that's the FBI's name for their wide-scale, you say, investigation and infiltration of the radical right in the early, mid-1990s. And it went, apparently it went throughout the 90s because... Um, here last summer, I received a phone call from a fellow who said, um, I've been seeing what's been posted on the Internet from your FOIA your lawsuits with the FBI. And I, he said, you have all the pieces, but you just haven't put them together. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you just don't see the picture. And so he came to see me, and I, I directed him to Newsweek magazine and to um, some other reporters he had been one of the top undercover operatives for the FBI and PATCON for almost 10 years. He had infiltrated some 23 groups. He started out believing it was the right thing. He wasn't, you know, so many of these informants are people who are caught in the act of committing a crime and are forced to go undercover for the FBI. He did it voluntarily because he thought these hate groups, what described him as hate groups, were dangerous. In hindsight, he said he looked back on it, and he sees now that the the agenda, the agenda was to infiltrate and incite uh, the militia movement, the right wing Christian movement, the violence, so that the Department of Justice could crush him. He said that Ruby Ridge was a PATCON operation. He said that Waco was a PATCON operation. He believed that Oklahoma City was, but he wasn't involved in it. But he did say that other members of the PATCON group were involved in Oklahoma City. At the center of the many threads of this operation was Elohim City, 
a white supremacist compound in Oklahoma whose chief of security was the enigmatic Andreas Strassmeyer, son of former German Chancellor Helmut Kohl's chief of staff and a former lieutenant in the German army with military intelligence training. And we have another angle on this as well from uh, Carol Howe. Um, are you familiar with her case? She was actually uh, hired uh, by the ATF uh, to infiltrate uh, the uh, compound in Elohim City, which was in uh, eastern Oklahoma, almost right on the Arkansas border. And uh, which she, they, they gave her uh, ordinance, they gave her pipe bomb material, everything, to just find out if the, the people within Elohim City were you know, capable of actually uh, doing something, such as the Oklahoma City bombing. And come to find out, there was ATF and FBI informants that she didn't even know about. So it was really an, an odd mix of informants and not communicating with each other. Catastrophic breakdown in the communication. I gave them warnings, targets, specific targets, addresses of targets, names of targets. I know of too many people that were talking about that building, talking about Oklahoma City, talking about doing something on that date using a truck bomb. In her report to the ATF in December, Howe reveals that Strassmeyer planned to forcibly act to destroy the U.S. government with assassinations, mass shootings, and bombings. He said he wanted to go blow up federal buildings. I mean, just point blank, that's what he said he'd like to be out there doing. Jane Graham, an eyewitness who worked in the Murrah building, observed Strassmeyer in the building the week before the bombing, going over blueprints and carrying what looked to be the components for C4 explosives and detonators. As alleged in David Hoffman's book, The Oklahoma City Bombing and the Politics of Terror, Strassmeyer first aroused suspicion that he was an undercover operative when he was caught in Texas entering a federal building at night with a key code. Did he have access to the Murr building also? When we interviewed Jane Graham, who was a survivor, she said that when she went to work, it was either the day before or two days before, I don't remember which, she parked in the basement parking, and when she got out of her car and was walking across the parking garage, she saw three guys down there wearing uh, coveralls and placing putty on the columns and stringing wire between the putty. Later, she picks out one of the guys from photographs and says, that's him, and it was Andrea Strassmeyer. Strassmeyer was there listening, going over the plans. He was listening to everything. He was, what they were talking about, looking at place, pointing to things. But when they were talking, whatever they happened to finally be talking about, and when I was looking at him at that point, then he left and went over to the other side of the building so I wouldn't keep watching him. The second man that was there, who appeared to be military, he's the one that the man in charge told to put the stuff back in the car. The second man, obviously was taking orders from the first man because he had wire in his hands, which I thought was telephone wire. It's that real light color, thin wire. And he also had what appeared to be gray putty. Well, that's exactly how you string composition C4 with debt cord. Despite all of this evidence, Strassmeyer was never interviewed by the FBI as part of their Oklahoma City investigation before he had the chance to flee the country and return to Germany. This is just one of many examples of seeming foreknowledge of the attack that have since been covered up or suppressed by the FBI and the ATF. The government has claimed that they had absolutely uh, no prior warning, um, and yet we start off with the interesting uh, little episode where two Air Force bomb squad guys, and these are very special Air Force bomb squad guys that we know were cleared to work for presidential security uh, VIP security and so on. Uh, they were ordered from Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico uh, to Oklahoma City on uh, arriving on Monday the 17th of uh, April, two days before the bombing. Their orders were to go to a motel and wait there until contacted by the FBI. Uh, I had become aware of this information in 1997, uh, developed some uh, confirming information uh, but uh, the key was that in the summer of 2001, uh, two journalists had separate conversations with uh, one of the individuals, one of the two individuals on this bomb squad team. He admitted he was there when asked in separate conversations by both journalists why he was there. He responded, you'll have to ask the FBI. 
there was this fairly large truck with a trailer behind it, and it had a shield on the side of the door, and it said bomb disposal or bomb squad below it. Authorities now claim in federal investigative reports that the huge ominous truck with its trailer was being used by a deputy to run routine errands. Other documents obtained by 2020 show that someone called the executive secretariat's office at the Justice Department in Washington and said the Morrow building had been bombed. But this was 24 minutes before the blast. No action was apparently taken. Yet another witness, a rescue worker, says after she talked with an agent at the bombing scene, she also suspected the ATF was warned and agents stayed away from their office that morning. I asked him if his office was in the building. And he said yes, and I asked if there were any ATF agents that were still in the building, and he said no, we weren't here. Witness number one approached an ATF agent nearby. He claims he asked the agent what had happened, and witness number one says this is what the agent told him. He uh, started getting a little bit nervous. He tried reaching somebody on a two-way radio. Uh, couldn't get anybody, and I told him I wanted an answer right then. He said they were in the briefing. None of the agents had been in there. They had been tipped by their pagers not to come into work that day. Plain as day out of his mouth. They were tipped. Why wasn't anybody else? Any one of these indications of foreknowledge of the blast would be incredible enough. Taken together, they provide corroboration of the thesis that the government in fact had informants in the plot and were allowing it to go ahead. But more startling by far than all of these accusations is the case of Dipole Might. Dipole Might was an ATF project to familiarize BATF agents with truck bomb debris patterns and to calibrate the effect of vehicular explosions on a variety of materials and structures. Beginning in 1994, the Bureau conducted a series of experiments at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, blowing up vehicles with C4 and ANFO explosives and analyzing the blasts to gauge the effect of terrorist bombings on government buildings. Even more incredible, pictures emerged in 1997 of a rider truck parked at Camp Gruber Training Center in Oklahoma. The source of the image, who feared for his safety and requested anonymity, asserted that the images were taken in early April of 1995, just two weeks before the bombing. The National Guard did eventually confirm that the images were authentic, and that the rider truck's presence at the camp was related to a weapons sensor project connected with the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, but issued a statement insisting that this rider truck and the weapons project it was associated with, quote, had no association whatsoever with the tragedy at the Alfred P. Murrah building, end quote. Could this be the other rider truck that witnesses reported seeing at Lake Geary several days before Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols arrived to construct their bomb? The official narrative dictates that Tim McVeigh alone rented the Ryder truck in Junction City, Kansas on April 17, two days before the bombing. He and Terry Nichols supposedly constructed the bomb on April 18. But the bulk of eyewitness accounts assert that the Ryder truck was at Geary Lake for several days before that. I retired uh, April 11, uh, 1995, and uh, after finishing up uh, that morning, I decided to stop by here and fish at uh, Geary State Lake, uh, which uh, is right in this general area here that uh, I was fishing from, uh, the pier, or jetty, and uh, I stayed here most of the afternoon uh, fishing, of course, with no luck, and uh, later on that uh, afternoon, I had decided to maybe go back over this way over here to the other point back there and see if I'd have any luck. Uh, when I, I noticed a rider truck over there. I was sitting at home one day and my wife came in from work and uh, she said that she had been stopped in a roadblock up here at Geary Lake in uh, reference to uh, the Oklahoma City bombing and the making of the bomb here at Geary State Lake and uh, with a rider truck. And I said, well, you know, I had told you about the rider truck I had seen there uh, before this. And uh, that's how I became aware of it. Uh, and then uh, the next thing I knew, she told the ATF and FBI, the people at the roadblock, that uh, what I had seen. And uh, and before I knew it, my house was swarming with uh, <laughs> agents. Multiple trucks, 
multiple bombs, government informants, prior warnings, Pat Kahn, John Doe No. 2, Andreas Strassmeyer. The indications of government participation and cover-up in the bombing itself continue to mount and mount, and they paint a very different picture of McVeigh than that of the lone wolf bomber that the government and media have spent 20 years asking us to believe in. But why? If there was government complicity in the plot to blow up the Murrah building, why would this be so? What would the government stand to gain from this? Firstly, PATCON gained its objective of discrediting militias, gun rights groups, and those concerned about governmental overreach once and for all in the mind of the American public. The United States of America, they believe that the United States government is prepared to usurp the Constitution and break down doors and confiscate guns. Am I lying to these people, Bob Fletcher and Jim Trockman? John Trockman. John, sorry, it says John here. You believe this? No, not quite like that. Not the U.S. government. Which government? The one world government? Yes, sir. You, you, the United Nations? Yes, sir. And you're in the woods now, and you're not, neither no. of you, you're not in the woods? No, no, no. Yeah, you're from Montana, the city of Noxon? Yes, sir, the little town of Noxon. 350 people? Maximum. Aha, uh -huh. and you living in the woods? No. no. No, you're not. Is anybody in Montana? Just their plain homes. You're sitting next to Ray Southwell, who does, from Michigan. You're li you, you, you gather in the woods, don't you? In Michigan? When we train? Yeah. That's correct. But you're not living there. I don't quite understand when you say you're living there. I live in northern Michigan, and uh, I have 20 acres that I live on, and there's a house there. Right. Secondly, an ATF that had suffered a severe backlash from its mishandling of events at Ruby Ridge and Waco could win public support and sympathy by parading as the victim of anti-government crazies. Thirdly, it provided new life to the Omnibus Counterterrorism Act of 1995, a controversial bill introduced by Joe Biden two months before the bombing that would have given police broad new powers to use secret sources and secret evidence in terrorism proceedings. Widely denounced as an affront to civil liberties, the bill was languishing in committee. But all that changed on April 19, 1995. The very day after the blast at the Murrah Building, the New York Times wrote about the bill that, after the Oklahoma City bombing, there were few surer legislative bets in Washington. The legislation morphed into the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996 and was passed the next year, with President Clinton specifically linking the bill to the bombing in his signing statement. Years later, Biden claimed that his original bill was the core of what eventually became the Patriot Act. Fourthly, the bombing also conveniently destroyed a number of documents that were proving to be problematic for the Clinton administration documents that had all somehow or other ended up being housed at the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City in April of 1995. Day one, hour two of the bombing, the most significant event that happened is when they said they found other bombs in the building. The second most significant event was that they moved everybody back and held them back. There were still people alive trapped in the building but they came in with two trucks and backed them up to the Murrah Building and a bunch of these uh, guys dressed in blue jackets with no letters on the back started taking boxes of files out and putting them on his truck. We were told uh, by a blonde uh, female uh, agent that there were files so so uh, serious to the government that until those files were located there would not be any recovery effort. If you remember the Whitewater investigation in Arkansas, all the paperwork was stored in the Murrah building. They had FBI agents over in the fields the west of the Murrah building picking up paper all, almost all day long. And it was during this time that uh, early in the investigation that I, I started receiving some various phone calls. Uh, one of them was a, a phone call from Little Rock, Arkansas. The guy said that he was a federal agent. He was not an FBI agent. He was not uh, ATF. But what he did say was during their investigation of the Clintons uh, on the, all the drug running that went through Mena, Arkansas and you know, Lassiter's Ranch and all of that stuff that was going on at the time during Iran-Contra, that those records, when, when uh, uh, Clinton went to Washington, were transferred from there to the Murrah building. But what about McVeigh? What was his role in all of this? Criminal mastermind? Convenient patsy? Unwitting dupe? Or sheep-dipped operative, exactly as he claimed to be? 
It's at this point that most such investigations would end, with the narrator metaphorically shrugging his shoulders and suggesting that the secrets of the bombing might have gone to the grave with McVeigh himself. But this is not such a story. In fact, there are reasons to believe that McVeigh never actually went to the grave at all. He, he told us many times, he, he would vacillate on this issue from time to time, but his main theme was that he was not going to be executed, that the, 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 the major was going to have someone infiltrate the execution team, and that he would be given drugs that would feign the appearance of death, but, and he says the CIA and other people use these drugs, and that uh, they, they, they would be taken out, and he would be brought, you know, to, uh, given some type of medication that would counteract the other, and that he would uh, be rewarded for, for serving his country. And, you know, it sounds, sounds a little bit far-fetched, but, I mean, I, I've talked to, to several people who, who witnessed the execution, including Janie Coverdale, and uh, she doesn't. She doesn't know one way or another whether Tim was executed. He was covered up from from toe to, to, to neck, and he couldn't see any any type of IV lines or anything running into his veins. Uh, and, and so she clearly says that she doesn't know if he he was executed or not. And she watched it. So um, you know, I, I don't know if Tim McVeigh is dead. McVeigh spent much of his time on death row fighting for a very unusual request to not have an autopsy performed on his body after his execution. Autopsies are standard procedures after federal executions and would have been performed on McVeigh, but his request was granted and no autopsy was ever performed. During the execution itself, one of the eyewitnesses, Susan Carlson of WLSAM Radio, reported McVeigh, quote, appeared to be still breathing, or what appeared to be shallow breathing, even after being pronounced dead and his eyes remained open. End quote. After the execution, prison officials admitted to using a decoy to throw the public off the trail of McVeigh, who was ostensibly transported to a local funeral home and cremated before his ashes were turned over to his attorneys. Perhaps it's appropriate, in a sick way, that we don't even have closure on this, the one part of the OKC bombing story that even the most incredulous have long believed was unquestionable. After all, the only constant in the case is that at every turn, the government has lied about what they know, withheld evidence, and otherwise kept the public in the dark about what really happened that day. Meanwhile, those brave few who have sought to shed light on these issues, or just gotten caught up in the story, have ended up with their lives transformed, their reputation shattered, and, in some cases, have lost their lives. All in maintenance of this mystery. Anti government extremist is one man. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. McVeigh. Timothy 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 McVeigh. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.